Welcome back to The Y. Let's bring in my next guest, Andrei Dobryansky, is with the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America. The organization helps represent more than a million Americans of Ukrainian descent, and he's also the chair of UN Affairs Committee for the Ukrainian World Congress. Andrei, a pleasure to have you on tonight. Thanks for having me on. So a lot of times when people hear about these kinds of stories, we hear more often from the leaders of those countries, not so much the people. You're very well connected to the Ukrainian community around the U.S. What's your sense on what Ukrainians want for their country? Well, right now, if you're talking to Ukrainian Americans, uh, you'll you'll hear a lot of people being worried. Uh, I know this week in church, uh, a lot of the priests were talking about it. A lot of the parishioners were talking about it. And uh, we have a global appeal happening from uh, all, both the Orthodox and Catholic churches of, uh, of the Ukrainian people around the world uh, to pray for Ukraine. So there's a lot of worry happening for regular Ukrainians around the world. Uh, within Ukraine, it depends where you are. If you're uh, situated in a border area, whether it's in Dnipro, which is a province right by the uh, Donbas zone, those people are getting med uh, medical training or uh, maybe some self-defense training. That's the same case for the people who are located all the way on the far western side because uh, there's Transnistria, the Russian occupied territory of Moldova. Those people are also getting themselves ready for a potential invasion. And the thing about the last eight years is a lot of Ukrainians have already been used to this wartime uh, state in Ukraine. So they have been helping their friends, their family, regular citizens uh, in terms of their deployment, sending them supplies to the front line. Mm. I'm curious what Ukrainians want to see from the U.S. government. Well, in Ukraine, they would like to see uh, immediate aid sooner rather than later. You you heard that from the president and the foreign minister, as well as voters here in the United States. Uh, we want to see sanctions happen now. So action happening before any kind of invasion. Uh, we hear from the State Department and the White House that they're waiting for an invasion before they uh, institute sanctions. At this point, after invading Ukraine, uh, not just in the Donbass, but Crimea, after invading Georgia, after having seven active conflict zones around around his border. I don't think there's any reason for the, the rest of the world to wait in, in terms of instilling sanctions on Russia. They need to be punished because what they're doing is they're throwing the entire world system out of whack. But do you think they're taking that punishment seriously? I mean, the U.S. has threatened sanctions. Do you believe the U.S. should be ready to do more if sanctions fail to, de to deter Russia? Well, what the United States should be doing, in addition to the wonderful aid, because uh, we know that 90 tons of aid were, was, was delivered within the last week to Ukraine, in addition to that, what the rest of the world needs to be ready for is a humanitarian crisis if this war really happens, if this further invasion really happens. It's estimated that somewhere between 6 and 10 million Ukrainians might be displaced. Already uh, 1.5 million are displaced. Can you imagine the European continent if a land war breaks out and millions of people, this is going back to World War II, that amount of people uh, being completely displaced. There needs to be field hospitals sent to Ukraine. There needs to be humanitarian stores and already uh, humanitarian aid organizations are stockpiles, stockpiling supplies in certain Ukrainian cities ready to help people. So as you watch this all play out, what's your biggest concern? My biggest concern is for the people, uh, the actual people who would be heard about this. Often we hear that Ukraine is a buffer zone. These are people we're talking about, not buffers. So uh, what I'd like to have, uh, have happen is people realize when they're discussing Ukraine to understand that these are real people uh, who will lose their homes, who have already lost their homes. Priests, rabbis, other religious leaders who are now banned from going back to their home or their parishes where they have, they have preached for decades. Uh, now you can't go back to Donbass. Same thing for Crimea. The indigenous people of Crimea would love to return back there, but the Crimean Tatars are considered not welcome back in Crimea. So uh, what I would like for the rest of the world is to think about Ukrainians as a people, not as a buffer zone, not as a, something to be gambled away. And for them to realize that if Ukraine is truly the breadbasket of Europe, what those economic consequences would be if something were to happen. Well, let me ask you this. Even as Ukraine becomes more westernized, how do you see the ties to the former Soviet Union play out? Do you get a sense there's a bit of a generational divide here? I've covered this topic for well over a decade, and you often hear that there's a bit of a longing from the older generation to have some type of former Soviet Union again, whereas the younger generation want their own independence and freedom to become much more Western. What's your right. take on that? 
If you want to talk about generational, I think that's the key word to talk about, and I thank you for bringing that up. But currently, the Ukrainian government and many governments in countries around Ukraine, uh, they are staffed by people who uh, are in their 30s, uh, people who, frankly, never lived Mm -hmm. in a, a Soviet Union. So there are people already in high levels of leadership in countries all around where one, from the Western point of view, we would call it the, the uh, ex-Soviet Union. But these are people who have never had that existence. So for them, their reality is they want to have a proper uh, chance to have a solid economic life, to have a, a, a an ability to, to feed their family and have a proper job and not have to leave their country as many of their friends have had to do for decades going to Europe. Uh, I know people with financial degrees that have to go to Poland to clean hotel rooms to, to sustain their entire family because the economy has been so been bogged down by this war. That's not what needs to happen. What needs to happen is that all, all these countries and all these people should be given the right to have a fully functioning, uh, economic, thriving society and not be constantly under attack by one nation. One nation is constantly doing this. Mm -hmm. Let me show you a few numbers. These are from polling done last year from the Center for Insight and Survey Research. The first one shows what economic union Ukrainians would be most interested in if it could only choose one. Their European Union was the overwhelming choice. And look at this. So 54% of those asked say they would vote for Ukraine to join NATO today. Just 28% voted against it. There's plenty of support to continue to associate with the West. But will Russia ever accept that reality? That's the big issue. And mm -hmm. that's why Ukraine needs to be and is currently on a path uh, to join NATO. They would like to get that membership action plan that was offered in 2008 uh, and, and reaffirmed several times by NATO because this problem isn't going away. Uh, we know that President Putin changed the Constitution, that he can be president until 2036. We don't see any other uh, line of uh, foreign policy from Russia other than to constantly invade its neighbors. So Ukraine not only needs help right now, but it is in the plans of trying to have a stable defense for years to come because Russia is not going to change its mind. It, it, it has done cyber attacks against many NATO members. It has uh, uh, done assassinations on NATO territory. This is a, a problem for the rest of the world to, to deal with together. And when we had all the countries of NATO sit across from Russia and Russia uh, put a list of demands, what you heard from NATO was them speaking in one, one voice, please get out of Ukraine, please get out of Georgia, and please get out of Moldova. So that's what the rest of the world needs to be doing for Ukraine. Or in terms of its general uh, safety and alliance, they need to be speaking as one because it'll only keep attacking. Mm -hmm. Andrei Dobryansky, really important perspective there from you. Thank you for coming on the Y. Thank you.